more time to dissect the perforator, and we can find the septums. We just make it an easy way to just harvest this uh, with the septum as the uh, the, the council we call the council uh, perforator. Actually, it is some uh, similar to the capillary capillary perforator. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the panel? Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu. Now we move to the next speaker. Okay, thank Dr. you. Dr. Farias will uh, speak about the uh, middle arm flat. Please, uh, Dr. Farias, go ahead. Hi, do you hear me now? Uh, my name is Efraín Farias, and I would like to thank Professor Adosoki for this kind invitation. And in the following meeting, we'll talk on lateral arm free flap. Uh, I work in Mexico City in the hand surgery department of the National Institute for Rehabilitation. And as a background, the lateral arm flap was initially described as the upper arm free flap by Song in 1982 as a possibility for soft tissue coverage. Kleiner and Kutz were the first to use it for free coverage in the hand. And in 1984, Ackland, Schusterman, and Katzaros described its use as an osteocutaneous flap from the distal humerus. More modifications have been described since then. In 1987, a case series of 19 29 ipsilateral free lateral flat arm flaps used for hand defects by Shecker, Kleinert, and Hanel was published. And since then, the flap has proven its usefulness for the treatment of soft tissue defects. More modifications have been described since then. And then update 1987, a case series of 29 ipsilateral free lateral flat arm flaps. The advantages of the lateral defects arm by Shecker are that Kleiner and Hanel was published here only. And since then, the flap has proven its usefulness for the treatment of well soft tissue defects. More modifications have been described since then. And then update 1987, a case series of 29 inch lateral free lateral flat arm flaps. The advantages of the lateral arm flaps are that Kleiner and Hanel was published here only. And since then, the flap has proven its usefulness for the treatment of soft tissue defects. More modifications have been described since then. And then update 1987, and then update 1987 and then update 1987 and then update 1987 and then update 1987 of the posterior radial collateral artery, the terminal branch of the brachialis profunda that nourishes the flap. This artery provides several periosteal, muscular, and fasciocutaneous branches, and the skin perforators irrigate the arm and the proximal fifth of the forearm. The drainage is by the cephalic vein and brachialis comitans. The pedicle length is up to 8 cm and the vessel's caliber is 1 to 2 mm. In this paper published in 2019, the authors analyzed several previous papers with the more common complications related to the appearance, including the need of debulking and unsatisfactory cosmesis. Our surgical technique is the same as the previously described elsewhere. We begin with the skin landmarks and the design of the skin island centering the flap along the septum, and we don't use tourniquet. We always try to start dorsal and distal until we reach the deep fascia, and the dissection is then carried out between the septum and the triceps identifying perforators, and then we can go to the anterior aspect of the arm. The radial nerve should be identified and protected, and following the septum, the pedicle is identified close to the septum insertion in the humerus. As here, we can see the neurovascular pedicle, 
with all the structures identified. The pedicle is then followed as proximal as needed up to eight centimeters long. Finally, the flap is harvested and the donor site ready to closure. Most of the times, primary closure is possible. And here are some clinical cases. The first is about a three-year-old uh, kid who left can and got caught on a meat grinder. He was initially treated on a general hospital. A tourniquet was placed and sent to our institution where an initial IND was performed. The evaluation showed poor vascularity of the index to ring fingers with severe damage to tendons, vessels, nerves, and bones of the three central digits. An initial revision amputation was performed with primary closure using unhealthy tissue with areas with poor vascularity and the skin under tension, as we can see. The patient progressed with a polymicrobial infection and after the debridement, a vacuum assisted closure device was placed. And uh, after infection was controlled, a lateral arm flap was used for coverage using the previously described technique. And the anastomosis is performed in the dorsal vessels close to the anatomical snuff box. And we prefer the use of microscope to perform the anastomosis as we can see in this intraoperative video, the chance of complications is lesser if a good arteriography is performed, as Dr. Toss uh, told us. Clinical results three months later, um, where a three-year-old patient can use his hand with a basic pinch for his daily activities and manipulate objects with both hands. In this case, an 11-year-old may sustain a crush injury diagnosed as a close facial injury. Two weeks later, he developed with a full thickness necrosis of the skin of the dorsum of the hand, measuring six per six centimeters. An ipsilateral arm free flap was planned for immediate coverage, as we can see in this video. A debridement is carried out until healthy tissue is obtained. And after debridement, the extensor apparatus was found intact. An immediate flap was performed, aiming to obtain pliable skin needed for full hand function. And here, the immediate pictures of the flap due to dorsal vein impairment, we left a temporary drain to prevent hematoma in this case. The flap provides a nice coverage for tendon gliding and preserves hand full range of motion, as we can see in these clinical pictures and the video recorded four months after the surgery. With this cosmetic appearance of the extremity, and reincorporation to his daily activities. This flap may be also an option for food coverage, as in 13-year-old male who sustained a motorcycle accident with a metatarsal open fracture and skin necrosis. A lateral arm flip flap was used as well to provide a, a vascularity and coverage to the dorsal aspect of the foot with this clinical flap incorporation and good radiological and clinical bone healing with a scar that can be covered with a t-shirt. The last case shows the versatility of the flap. A 46-year-old uh, female who sustained a severe injury of the right hand with a tortillas machine, a very dangerous device that accounts for hundreds of hand injuries in Mexico every year. She was treated initially in a general hospital where IND and primary closure were performed. And three days later, uh, she arrived with this swollen hand, fetid exudate and extreme pain. And the initial findings were a deep infection with a median nerve suture to the flexor pollicis longus and arterial thrombosis in the hand. And after several debridements where much of the anterior forearm muscles had to be excised with positive, positive cultures for polybacterial infection, required recurrent surgical procedures to debride all the infected and non-viable tissue showing a slow progression to infection eradication. A cutaneous effect 13% centimeters in size can be seen in the palmar aspect of the wrist, hand, and index to ring fingers. Initially, an anterior uh, interosseous artery flap was planned to cover the defect. We can see here the posterior interosseous pedicle at the wrist, the flap harvest, and its passage to the volar aspect of the hand with no tension. However, the flap was lost due to venous thrombosis and had to be removed. So a lateral uh, arm free flap is well indicated when another flap is lost. Um, we harvested a large flap 
designed to cover the defect up to the base of the central fingers, as we can see in this picture. Uh, with one large single flap, all the skin defect can be closed using the same extremity as donor side. With this result, the patient currently has no desire of further reconstructive efforts. As a conclusion, we may consider several aspects when choosing a flap. The lateral arm flap is a great option in patients of all ages with soft tissue defects. It's a reliable, reproducible, and versatile flap that can be used even when a previous flap fails. This flap has high success rate, over 95%. The surgical time could be less than three hours since it's easy to raise, and the patient may be discharged as soon as the third postoperative days. This flap is a workhorse flap, has a low donor site morbidity, the scar can be concealed with a t-shirt, therefore it's very suitable, especially for males. The skin color is similar to the recipient area, and finally, we are sure it's an excellent and practical alternative for reconstruction. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. And thank you uh, very much, Dr. Fariat, for a very, very, very nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you one question. What is the maximum diameter that you can harvest with the skin with this flap? With the skin, it's reported that um, uh, we can use up to 14 centimeters long and 7 to 8 centimeters wide. Um, we can take a little bit more, but the closure, the permanent closure would be difficult and we'll have to use a skin graft for uh, coverage of the donor site. Do you have any problems with the feeding vessel, with the perforate or the size of the vessel? No, in any case, in your experience? No, actually not. And I like a lot this flap because, uh, as we can remember, the upper extremity in pediatric population, it's very well developed compared with the lower extremity. So uh, even in, in small children, and when we are harvesting the flap, the flaps are very reliable and um, it's a very well vascularized area. So I think it's a it's a very good option, and it could be an alternative for hand reconstruction. Reconstruction um, is very good because you can use the same arm, and the harvesting is very fast. And you can check the other team uh, finding the uh, recipient recipient vessels. Uh, so everything is it's uh, very comfortable to do it uh, quickly and reliably. Okay, any questions from the panel or the audience? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Farias, for a very nice presentation. Now we move to the Thanks. next speaker. Uh, my dear Professor Dr. Muhammad Qod will speak about the free latissimus free flab harvest. Please, Dr. Muhammad, go ahead. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Muhammad Mustafa Kotb. I'm working at ASIUT University Hospital. Uh, and it's my pleasure to share uh, our experience with all uh, the eminent names sharing this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Professor Ahmed Dusuki, my dear friend and colleague, and all of you, Professor uh, Tos Luigi, Professor Zhu, Professor Ferias. Uh, you are most welcome. and. Uh, I will uh, share with you my experience regarding the uh, free latissimus dorsi uh, flap. So I'm working at uh, Asyut. Asyut city is 400 kilometers south to uh, Cairo, the capital of Egypt. And uh, we have uh, Asyut University Hospital. Uh, like you can uh, see, is uh, one of the biggest hospital in, in Egypt and uh, serving about 30 million uh, population. Uh, this is the campus of our university hospital, and here is the old building, and this is the new one. 
uh, for trauma. And so we got this building for the trauma center, and this is for the hand and microsurgery. And eventually in the opening ceremony, we'll be delighted to receive all of you uh, here. So uh, took, uh, going back to the latissimus dorsi myocutaneous flap, it's one of the most uh, versatile and useful uh, flaps in reconstructive microsurgery. And I'm sure all of you have practiced this before in your uh, work. It is known for its use in chest wall and post mastectomy. However, if it is used uh, freely, it can be used for coverage of la large soft tissue defects in head and neck and the extremities. Uh, the earliest application of uh, latissimus dorsi was in head and neck and as a medical by Killen in 1978. And uh, the first microvascular free tissue transfer for the lab was described by Watson in 1979. So let's talk about the versatility, the versatility of this flab. The latissimus can be transferred as a myofascial flab, myocutaneous flab, composite osteomyocutaneous, including serratus, anterior, and ribs, and also can be used as a mega flap in combination with any of or all of the other flaps based on the subscapular vessels, the subscapular uh, compound flap, including serratus anterior, scapular, and parascapular flaps. Talking about the advantage of uh, latissimus dorsi myofascial flap, it is uh, a large volume uh, tissue is available for reconstruction. Long vascular pedicle offers excellent range of pedicle flaps. High caliber pedicle makes free flap vascular anastomosis technically more feasible. And uh, possibility of independent skin paddle being able to address complex defects uh, like through and through uh, oral cavity, for example. You can include rib or scapular bone. Uh, this is available also options. Minimal Doran site uh, morbidity occurs and it can be combined, as we have said, uh, with subscapular uh, flaps. Uh, so the function of the, talking about the function of the latissimus, and this is uh, very important to decide whether to harvest it or to search for another option. Uh, it helps patients in a lot of uh, daily uh, uh, activities. And this is very crucial in patients uh, with hemiplegia or using his hands to move over or using crutches. So uh, you must be careful in choosing this flab in such a uh, group of patients, otherwise you will compromise uh, their motion. Uh, it's very important that the, the action of the latissimus is not dependent on itself on, only. So in the lateral position, like you see, it is also combined with the serratus anterior to provide uh, the stability of the scapula and on the dorsal plane, you can see it is working on the contralateral uh, gluteus maximus uh, for climbing uh, and uh, other functional exercises uh, can be done by uh, those patients. Let's talk uh, uh, rapidly about the anatomy. So the origin coming from the spinous process of vertebrae uh, T7 to L5, soracolumbar fascia, iliac crest, inferior three to four ribs, inferior angle of the scapula. All these are the attachment of origin and must be addressed while you are harvesting uh, uh, your flap. The insertion is going to the intertubercular groove of the humerus, and the feeding vessel, uh, uh, it has two dependent, uh, independent uh, vascular supplies. The first one is the soracodorsal branch, which is the terminal branch of the uh, uh, third part of the axillary artery uh, 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 from the subscapular artery, and also uh, receiving uh, segmental uh, supply from the uh, intercostal uh, arteries. So the intercostal arteries are supplying the most uh, medial and inferior part of the flap. So you must be sure about uh, this and this should be uh, sacrificed while you are uh, using or harvesting it freely. And uh, it is not reliable to use the whole length of the muscle because this part of the muscles are not dependent on the soracodorsal uh, artery. And the nerve is, uh, is supplied by soracodorsal uh, nerve. And this schematic presentation showing the uh, part of the uh, uh, flab while you can use as a pedicle and how you can uh, disinsert the uh, insertion so you can uh, use it as a pedicle uh, flab. 
بوست اوبريتيف بروتوكول از اول تايبس اوف ذا مايكروفاسكولار انستوموزيس يو كان مونيتور ذيس If it is uh, uh, not deep, you can uh, monitor through the viability of the flaps, through the uh, pin prick, the temperature, the color, uh, the trigger of the muscle. And if it is deep, you can use a myofascial flap so you, part of the skin can be harvested, especially on the anterior border of the latissimus. And this is acts like a monitor for the vascularity of the flap. It's very important also to uh, monitor the collection because uh, after harvesting the latissimus, you will have a very big pocket. Uh, it can uh, have a seroma collection and eventually infection. So you got to uh, monitor this using uh, suction drain. Usually we put two suction drain and we leave it uh, up to uh, uh, 72 hours after uh, the surgery. Uh, regarding the contraindication, of course, if the patient has got uh, radiotherapy, for example, after radical neck dissection, and uh, you will be worried about the vascular, uh, the vascularity, and the ability to do anastomosis for such vessels with extreme fibrosis and adhesions. The other uh, uh, contraindication, as we have said, if the patient is handicapped or using his hand in. Uh, uh, in the wheelchair or crutches. So to conclude, the clinical use of latissimus, it is either functional or non-functional. And as a functional, you can use it a pedicle or a free. And if it is non-functional, you can use it as a pedicle or free also. And you can uh, take it as a myofascial, myocutaneous composite or a mega flare. So let's talk uh, uh, a brief about using it as a free tissue transfer for coverage. For example, this is a nine years old uh, uh, boy. He he was uh, uh, in, endorsed in a road traffic accident. He was uh, riding a trip with his father and mother who will eventually died in the accident. And he got this uh, huge part of soft tissue uh, defect on the dorsum of the forearm with loss of all the extensor tendons. And uh, this is showing intraoperative photo of the uh, latissimus dorsi after uh, uh, cutting it from the all attachments and only the vascular bitterial, which is intact. And this is after anastomosis to the radial artery and vein for coverage of this huge uh, soft tissue defect. And this is a, a, a functional uh, after coverage of uh, split sickness skin graft of uh, succeeded uh, microvascular anastomosis and taking and after reconstruction of the extensor tendons, you can have uh, such uh, a good function after such uh, uh, massive uh, road traffic accidents and tissues. Another example, this is uh, Aldo, uh, 34 years old with a run over accident. And you can see how much is the soft tissue defect on the dorsum of the distal forearm, wrist, and hand. And do the bone uh, is exposed in the metacarpal bones, the distal radius, and the joint is open. And uh, uh, after the bridement, uh, uh, and the uh, unlucky patient got a polytrauma uh, event, so he got intercostal tube and head injury, so he cannot withstand. Uh, a reconstructive microvascular procedure at the first scene. So we make a, a biological uh, uh, coverage by this uh, uh, artificial skin flaps to cover the important structures like bone and periosteum and the tendons until complete healing. And this is the harvest of the latissimus after coverage uh, and anastomosis with radial artery or, uh, also. And this is after uh, coverage by split sickness skin graft. And also uh, we can see the deficiency of the extension. So we make a tendon transfer, flexor carpial nares, extended by uh, iliotibial band. We split it into four parts for the four fingers. And this is the functional, uh, the final functional outcome after restoring the ability of finger flexion and extension. Another example was composite uh, soft tissue defect on the volar and dorsal aspect of the hand and after the bridement. Uh, this is uh, latissimus because it's, it's very difficult to provide a very big uh, versatile skin flap to cover all this part. So we've chosen uh, the latissimus. As you can see, it's very huge for this defect. Uh, 
uh, but fortunately part of it uh, have uh, necrosed and this is after deployment of the necrosed part the soft tissue coverage of the bone are in a good condition so we, we put a split thickness skin graft and this is the functional outcome after uh, we finalized all the reconstructive procedure for uh, such patient and this is to remind you about the original presentation at the scene of accident and the final outcome he can uh, use it in the activities of daily living uh, with a reasonable uh, and satisfactory result for uh, the patient Another example to, to have it as a bitical, and uh, this is a scheme to show you the excursion of different uh, muscles around the shoulder. And you can see latissimus uh, is taking 5.9 uh, 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 degrees for the excursion. So we can use it uh, as a transfer for reconstruction of the uh, shoulder external rotation. Uh, to use it uh, as uh, external rotator for uh, obstetric brachial plexus cases. And this is an intraoperative example after dissection of the latissimus and suturing to the infraspinatus tendon. And this is a postoperative cost in abduction external rotation. And this is the final outcome for shoulder external and the internal rotation after tendon transfer. If this can be used uh, in adults, yes, but we usually combine it with the tears measure to have a more powerful muscle to make this uh, rotation of such a shoulder and you get uh, excellent results for such patient by combined latissimus and tears measure transfer for the infraspinates. Another uh, use of uh, the uh, latissimus is to use it for reconstruction of massive repairable uh, rotator cuff tears and nowadays we shift from the latissimus to the uh, lower trapezius because its fibers uh, runs in a more parallel uh, to infraspinatus than the latissimus. However, it brings uh, very nice result, and we usually we uh, make it uh, by uh, iliob tibial band to lengthen the harvested muscle. And this is intraoperative photos to show you the dissection of the latissimus. The suture of the iliotibial band and the final outcome uh, you, you you can have such uh, results. So in conclusion, latissimus dorsi is a reliable and versatile and is considered as a workhorse for soft tissue coverage, especially in large uh, massive soft tissue uh, injuries. It is a, it, it got a reliable pedicle and average sized pedicle for anastomosis. It can be used as a pedicle or for restoration of function in obstetric brachial plexus and massive rotator uh, cuff tears. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Palma, for a very nice presentation. I have one question for you. Um, uh, what is the advantage of the freelatismus over the other skin clads? For the coverage of the soft tissue effect, why we use it over other flaps like ALT, like lateral arm flap, and other perforator flaps? We consider latissimus for the large defects, uh, massive or complex, like uh, for example post traumatic or post tumor resection, as we have said from as we have seen from the example I have shown. So it is a, a very big size and uh, it can fill uh, very hollow uh, or big uh, gaps with, with combined uh, bone and soft tissue even or skin. Uh, so we consider the use of latissimus only for big defects, not so for small. So for small, we can use, uh, of course, LT, uh, radial forearm flap or lateral arm like the previous uh, excellent, brilliant uh, presentations. Uh, what about with bearing area? Is it better than three skin flaps or the muscle flap is better? Which is better, do you think? Yes, we got a study uh, making a comparison between using a skin flap for the reconstruction of the heel and the plantar aspect of the foot. So uh, the skin flap is, uh, gives the patient uh, some sort of uh, instability because the gliding layer of, soft, of uh, subcutaneous fat gives the patient uh, the sense of insecurity while he is putting his foot on the floor. However, the using the latissimus gives much better results regarding 
uh, this feel of insecurity that uh, brings uh, that brought to the patient if you use the free skin so for reconstruction of the uh, plantar aspect of the uh, foot and the ankle uh, we prefer muscle flap but the dorsum we prefer uh, skin flap because uh, muscle flap on the dorsum uh, also this is one of the results of our study showed uh, contracture and will uh, hinder the ankle into uh, calcaneous uh, calcaneal uh, deformity so we prefer it for the plantar aspect of uh, foot and ankle can we use it for both coverage and function uh, actually uh, some papers shown that it can be used because the uh, sorocodorsal nerve is very good to uh, make it but it is uh, like a multi uh, uh, muscle and the excursion is not so good like for example the gracilis so for restoration of function we prefer using gracilis muscle because uh, unipinnate and uh, gives a much better uh, excursion so the functional the final functional outcome will be better uh, to be used like this but we use it like a medical for example to uh, restore a triceps or to restore a biceps uh, so like a medical it brings also uh, a good results in such cases uh, thank you very much any questions from the panel or the audience okay <coughs> and uh, professor cope <coughs> thank Thank you for your presentation. I have a question uh, about the case uh, used the residual flap to cover the hand. So is it possible to harvest the part of the muscle? Because the, you said it's a partial necrosis of the muscle and then the it will be uh, thin and then with a split skin graft. So do you uh, consider to, to just a harvest part of the muscles? Yes, we, we can use uh, part of the muscle, but actually the patient have a uh, circumferential skin loss over each finger plus uh, the defect on the palmar and dorsal aspect of the hand. So it was a, a huge uh, defect. So we, we used the part of the muscle and even after we use it apart, it, it became very huge one, like you have seen from the uh, photo. Uh, and also we make like a artificial or surgical syndactyly and do we plant after this uh, splitting of these fingers. So we used the, the, the half of the muscle in such a case. However, it, it became very bulky like you have seen. Unfortunately, part of it uh, became necrosed, so we got a good result. But of course, it, this was a, a part of the muscle, not the whole latissimus, of course. Oh, thank you. A little more questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, now we uh, move to the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is my presentation, so please uh, broadcast the video. Dear professors and colleagues, I am delighted to be here with you today. The purpose of my presentation is to showcase the video demonstration of the free vascularized fibular graft harvest technique. I hope that my presentation will provide you with valuable insights into this procedure and its potential applications. The free vascularized fibular graft is a popular bone graft used in microsurgery due to its ease of harvest and minimal harvest site morbidity. It can be harvested as a bone, osteocutaneous, or osteomyocutaneous flap, and the fibula can be osteotomized and shaped to fit the recipient site. The versatility of the free vascularized fibular graft makes it a suitable option for replacing bone defects in various areas of the musculoskeletal system, including the lower limb, pelvis, upper limb, spine, and fossiomaxillary regions. Bone defects can result from various causes such as trauma, infection, tumor resection, or congenital deficiency. The free fibular graft relies on the peroneal vessels, which have their origin in the posterior tibial vessels. 
Additionally, the monitoring skin paddle that receives its blood supply through skin perforators that run behind the fibula and pass through the posterior crural septum. A CT angiogram is not required unless dorsalis pedis artery pulsation is absent or vascular pathology is suspected. Locating perforators using a handheld Doppler is recommended but not mandatory. Our approach to harvesting a free fibular graft is illustrated in this figure. Firstly, we separate the fibula and skin paddle from the gastrosoleus muscle posteriorly. Then, we proceed anteriorly to separate the fibula from the peroneal muscles, anterior compartment, interosseous membrane, and tibialis posterior muscle. To perform a free fibular flap surgery, the fibula bone is first marked on the skin and divided into three sections, proximal, middle, and distal. An S-shaped incision is made on the skin, and the skin paddle is centered around the junction between the middle and distal thirds, where most of the perforators are located. The procedure starts by incising the posterior aspect of the skin paddle, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue are elevated until the sural nerve is visible. The deep fascia is then incised just anterior to the sural nerve to avoid postoperative neuroma. Next, the posterior aspect of the skin paddle is elevated with deep fascia and the skin perforators can be seen under the deep fascia. The perforators are further visualized by separating the gastrosoleus from the posterior crural septum and at least one perforator is needed to supply the skin paddle. The dissection is continued proximally by separating the soleus from the posterior aspect of the peroneal muscles and fibula, taking care to separate the origin of the soleus from the proximal part of the fibula, which is intimately related to the common peroneal vessels. The proximal part of the fibula is then exposed, the common peroneal nerve is protected, and the fibula is osteotomized using a Geely saw. Before incising the anterior aspect of the skin paddle, the presence of at least one perforator is ensured. Two perforators running through the posterior crural septum to the skin paddle can be seen here. The anterior aspect of the skin paddle is then incised, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue are elevated. The superficial peroneal nerve is identified, and the deep fascia is incised just posterior to that nerve. Using sharp dissection, the deep fascia of the skin paddle is separated from the peroneal muscles, and then the peroneal muscles are grasped and pulled anteriorly. While cutting with the scalpel, it is directed towards the peroneal muscles to allow the skin paddle with its deep fascia to fall back, preventing accidental harm to the perforators. Using a Geely saw, the distal portion of the fibula is exposed and cut. Typically, the osteotomy is performed 10 centimeters proximal to the lateral malleolar tip. However, a recent biomechanical study has suggested leaving the distal 10% of the fibula intact. Bone holders are used to grasp the proximal and distal ends of the fibula, which is then externally rotated. 
The paramil muscles are then carefully separated from the fibula using sharp dissection, leaving behind a thin layer of muscle surrounding the bone. Afterwards, the anterior crural septum is cut close to the fibular edge. This is followed by the separation of the anterior compartment muscles and the interosseous membrane from the fibula, again using sharp dissection. The paramial vessels are exposed at the distal osteotomy site and ligated. The proximal fibular end is retracted and the paramial vessels are dissected and separated from the posterior tibial nerve and vessels. The procedure then reverts to the posterior aspect and the separation of the soleus is completed and any muscular branches are ligated unless it is planned to harvest it as an osteomusculocutaneous flap. The fibula is then separated from distal to proximal and the flexor hallucis longus is sharply cut, leaving a small cuff that covers the common peroneal vessels. Next, we focus on the peroneal vessels and separate the artery from the vena comitantes. It is crucial to perform this step before ligating the vessels as it becomes significantly more challenging afterwards. Afterwards, we deflate the tourniquet to verify the vascularity of the graft and skin paddle. The skin perforators are clearly visible and there is free bleeding from the skin edge. Thank you for your attention. So now I'm open to any questions. Very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm thank thanking you. the voice-over technique that allows the presentation to be very good because my accent is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ahmad, thank you very much. I would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. The anomalies of the uh, pronial uh, vascular pedicle, uh, do you need to do a CT angiopre to uh, predict if there is anomaly because sometimes one of the anomalies that uh, makes a common uh, pronea tibial trunk as a one vessel feeding the food. So how can you manage this? Uh, no, as long as the, the rosary speed artery is... Uh, you must check the, the dorsal space pulsation. If the dorsal space pulsation is, pulsation is absent, in this case, you need to, to do CT angiogram. The presence of dorsal space pulsation ensures the uh, the uh, the uh, the. Uh, the uh, Hello. Hello. C can you hear me? Yes. Just yes. now. Uh, now, I'm sorry yes. for the, uh, our talent.
uh, we check the dorsal species pulsation. If the dorsal species pulsation is intact, you do not you do not need to do CT angio. If it is absent in this case, you need to do to do CT angio. The presence of dorsal uh, pulsation, dorsal species pulsation intact, indicates uh, a, a good anatomy or flexible anatomy of the comoporeal uh, vessels. So you just check the dorsal species. If it is intact, you don't need to do anything more. Okay, you, you, you told us to leave uh, 10% of the length of the fibula distally. Uh, this goes for or yes. for, also for the pediatric group or it is different uh, percentage? And then, uh, both of them, but in pediatric group, you have to do uh, another procedure. You have to do uh, TBU fibular uh, synostosis to avoid progressive deformity of the ankle. Okay. Also, what, how do you deal with the flexor halluses? Because most of those patients will get uh, drop uh, big two or contracture of the, uh, the flexor halluses because in this dissection, uh, nearly you uh, devascularize this muscle. So it will uh, go into contracture. What is your experience? Yes, in most of the cases, uh, in the first cases, we almost have some sort of uh, flexion contracture of the big two. So in the preceding cases, we we aim at uh, um, uh, future the flexor height longest while putting the big two in the maximum dorsal flexion. And uh, upon doing that, we avoid this complication. And also upon the section of the uh, flexor height from the common pronator vessels, you, you should be very careful and leave only small calf of muscle around the vessel. You do, you do not take too much. You suture it to the interosseous membrane or the posterior coronal septum? Interosseous membrane. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, that's good. I have a patient about the design of the uh, skin petal. So, which uh, perforator you prefer to use? From the video, it seems in the middle and the lower third of the uh, leg. So would you like to use the more uh, posterior uh, perforators because it's uh, much more bigger than the distal one? Uh, you know, most of the skin perforators are located um, at the junction between the middle and the distal third of the fibula most of the perforator. So I always lock, I always center the, the skin paddle around the junction between the middle and the distal perforator. And I almost always you I start from the zero to ensure the presence of the perforator. So uh, if you harvest the uh, two or more perforators, it may be uh, difficult to rotate the skin if there's a wound and the bone is in the in the lot in the same alignment. So that, that means not freely to uh, transfer the flap. So you always uh, yes, always um, uh, more more perforator or just one enough? Uh, no, one perforator is usually enough for the skin battle. But whenever we, we, we don't use to move the skin or to rotate it, uh, two perforator is good. But if I, I want to rotate the skin paddle and move it more, then I sacrifice one of them and leave the bigger one and also cut the uh, cruel symptom so can easily move, move the skin to cover any area. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Now um, it's about time we have to close. We have to uh, thank you very much to all of you for your uh, contribution and your presentation. It was a very elegant presentation. Thank you very, very much. And we have we 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 hope to meet uh, very 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 soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you Thank too. you, all of you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Bye.